thank you very you much, much for tolerating uh, the English lesson this afternoon, and thank you very much for the organizers for allowing me to speak a little bit to this topic, which um, occupies much of our internal discussion within the company uh, about the money that we spend for research in various uh, connection uh, contexts. Uh, and of course, the first question that arises is why do it at all, especially if it's not directly tied to a product, uh, some other significant effort that we're making on the sales side. Uh, and the first reason is because it's the right thing to do. Uh, we do research in topics that are obviously connected to the things we know about, um, no pun intended, but the general idea is that we do research in areas that are underserved uh, where we can make a difference. Uh, and steel to concrete connections, one of the areas we're very active in, is a terribly underserved area in structural engineering practice. Uh, those of you that went through a civil engineering curriculum recently uh, probably had very little exposure to this topic, even though once you got out into practice, you suddenly realized that it was a big deal. And then you had to take the word of companies that made products in this arena for how these connection properties worked, uh, and that's an uncomfortable feeling uh, for a structural engineer. I started as an engineer in the early 80s uh, and found that that was the case then. Um, I subsequently educated myself. Uh, it's a long story that we won't go into uh, on this topic and eventually uh, found that I could play a role in expanding the topic uh, into something that is um, rigorous and well supported by testing. So that's number one. Then number two, uh, because when we do research in this field, it allows us to innovate in a more productive way um, because we have a better idea of what it is that we're supposed to be innovating for. You'd be surprised at some of the things that people decide are an innovation when they really have no context to work from uh, in the structural world. And uh, that's something we struggle with all the time, is trying to make sure that the innovation things that we work on are relevant to what we do. So connections are, of course, the glue that make buildings work. Uh, some people define buildings as beams and columns that are connected by connections. And the connections are the part of the building that are the most important, particularly in the seismic arena. Uh, when I started in the profession in San Francisco in the 1980s, it was the first thing we learned about connection design because it was so underserved as a topic in the university and because it was so important to good structural performance under seismic demands. And I had a strict teacher, his name was Henry Degenkolb, and the people that he trained uh, brooked no dissent, so to speak, in this area of connection design. There were certain connections that worked, and there were connections that didn't, and we had to memorize those and get good at them. What you see on the screen is uh, the tallest building in Los Angeles. Uh, it has a buckling restrain brace frame system, pretty exotic, uh, but the most important thing for me was that that BRBF had to be tied back to a concrete core and the connection of that BRBF system back to the concrete core uh, was a matter of some controversy because the design of that connection was done using finite elements. Uh, and when I queried the young engineers about it, they were a little vague as to how that connection design was executed. Um, that's not their fault. That's just because that's the state of things when it comes to large connections between steel and concrete where there's a lot of force and a lot of shear lag involved. It becomes a very complicated problem. Uh, we also do research in connections, of course, at a much smaller scale. Um, I'll see if I can make this video go, or maybe they can make it go from the back. I don't have a, I don't have a scroll here. Um, is that possible to make the video work? Yeah, so what you're seeing is a shake table test at uh, the Richmond Field Station in Berkeley. Uh, these are actually Tesla battery boxes that were donated uh, for the cause. Um, and we're running a broadband motion, so it's not really fair. Uh, we're querying every possible frequency uh, to make these things fail. What was of interest to us was two things. One, that the boxes, uh, the way they were anchored by the Tesla engineers, 
uh, had some real frailties associated with it, and two, that the design of those kinds of connections typically is done in a very rudimentary manner where you simply take the mass of the box and divide it up to the number of connection points. Since these boxes had big doors on them, they were three-sided boxes, meaning their center of mass was well to the back of the box, and therefore the two anchorages points in the back took all of the load, and the ones in the front did almost nothing. That was a lesson that we just learned off of a very expensive shake table test, uh, but it's one that one could have intuitively uh, arrived at. So we've been engaged uh, in uh, a couple of big efforts over the last few years. I'm going to cover those, hopefully, in the time I have left. Uh, the first one has to do with um, our efforts to understand uh, the effect of earthquakes on structural members in which anchors would be located. Uh, we've done a lot of work in that arena with UC San Diego. We started with Frieder Seibley, and then more recently we've been working with uh, Professor Hutchinson and, and uh, Rob Dowell, who came out of Frieder Seibley's program. Uh, and our effort here has not been to produce PhDs uh, or dissertations, but rather to generate enough critical mass that we can actually have an effect on practice. And I think we've been reasonably su successful in that regard. We start this kind of research with a question. And in this case, the question was, if we take the theories that were developed around the behavior of reinforced concrete frames, and how that translates into anchor behavior. What about the more typical situation where walls are involved? Uh, for a lot of the structures that we put anchors into, uh, we have things like this to deal with. And the question was very simple. Are the damage patterns that we would ex expect to occur uh, here in this condition similar enough to the damage patterns that we see in reinforced concrete frames that we don't have to treat those things differently from the standpoint of anchor behavior. So to find that answer, we constructed a couple of walls. Uh, if you do any work in this arena, you know that most of the time, shear wall research is done at about a third scale. It's just a lot more efficient to do it that way. Uh, your ram doesn't have to be as big and you don't have as much concrete to deal with. We didn't have that option, why? because we can't make scale anchors. So the anchors had to be full scale, the wall had to be full scale in order for us to understand what we wanted to understand. So we had walls that you see uh, on the screen of some size and uh, all the attendant issues associated with putting walls like that under uh, various levels of uh, horizontal displacement, uh, wherein we were measuring uh, crack patterns, uh, of course, at increasing drift levels, very important that the walls be designed so that they fail by strut failure eventually, not by sliding shear failure at the base. Uh, the graduate student who worked in this uh, area was constantly being admonished to make sure that sliding shear failures would not occur. She was very happy uh, with the outcome of these tests. Along the way, of course, we installed anchors in these walls. Uh, we had debates about what we would do in that regard and eventually came to this solution. Uh, maybe wasn't the most optimal solution, but it was a way to put anchors under load consistently as the wall went through various levels of distress. Uh, and we were able to learn a lot about anchor behavior uh, under these conditions. Uh, the chart you see here is simply the kind of information that we were recording off of the anchors. We had them under a constant load. Of course, as the cracks would progress through the wall, uh, that would in induce a slip in the anchors. I think you can see the progression of damage in this wall here. Uh, and that would then in turn uh, force us to stop the test and retighten the anchors, bring the load back up. Uh, and then the anchors, of course, would suffer uh, more damage. So out of that little exercise, we were able to predict uh, what kind of lo load losses would occur. And one of the other things, of course, that was of curious, uh, uh, curiosity was clarification that indeed anchors act as stress risers. And so when cracks occur in a planar element like that, they're going to find the anchor locations as a matter of course. So these are some of the uh, images from the, the uh, low aspect walls uh, that we did. We did two low aspect walls, one with uh, axial load, one without. Um, I found the low axial, low aspect walls to be of particular interest because most of what the ACI code addresses is flexural behavior in shear walls. 
Uh, and many of us know that a lot of what we actually deal with are low aspect walls where flexural behavior is not really relevant. Uh, so the behavior of these walls was quite interesting for us. And you can see the uh, eventual uh, damage that occurred uh, as we pushed things out to the end. Uh, I think I was talking with Sarah here at lunch, and she likes to force things into failure, and so do I, and so does any experimentalist. Eventually, you just say, okay, let's see what happens if we, if we crush it and, and push it all the way over. The point of these photos, though, is that if you can imagine anchors under those conditions, of course, there's no anchor. I don't care what it's made of that's going to survive uh, in a wall at that point. So what did we learn out of this work? Well, one, we learned that we can simulate the cracking in these walls uh, with relatively simple numerical models. That was the object of the graduate work that was being done here. Um, and these macro models that were developed uh, did a very nice job of predicting the crack patterns that we saw. So that was great. Uh, number two, uh, fortunately, we were able to conclude that the cracking in the walls in terms of crack widths at least outside of the plastic hinge regions, uh, was similar enough to what we see in frames so we don't have to reinvent that, uh, that story for walls. Uh, number three, however, is the bad news, which is that uh, we can't put anchors in regions of heavy damage. And in a flexural wall or in a flexural member, we kind of know where those regions are. We can limit them. We do a lot of work to try to define where they are. Uh, in these low aspect uh, situations, it gets very tricky. I'll give you an example. In a well-designed low aspect ratio wall, the cracking will be distributed of a nice crack pattern pretty much over the entire area of the wall. Eventually, it concentrates down in the toes, uh, and you have a lot of aggravated damage down there. If you have a wall that's poorly reinforced, then all of that strain is going to aggregate right to the two, the two struts. And so the regions outside aren't going to see a lot of damage, right? So that's very good for the anchors, not so great for the wall. But we have to take that into account when we advise people as to how to lay out anchors for particular retrofit situations, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to understand the behavior of low aspect planar elements and what that means in terms of damage accumulation. OK, topic two. Uh, this is uh, more recent and uh, very near to uh, my heart currently because I'm leading the charge on this in ACI. Uh, we're trying to resolve uh, some fundamental inconsistencies th between the way anchorage is treated uh, from a code standpoint and the way reinforcing bar development is treated. Development is what the term that we use to describe <coughs> Excuse me, the embedment that you need for a piece of reinforcement in order to make it conform to certain objectives, usually yield of the bar. Uh, and as I got into this subject, I realized that many, many design engineers, some who are very involved with the code, uh, don't really understand the principles under which those equations were set up, and they don't understand what the actual outcome uh, of using those equations might be under certain circumstances. And that's been a real learning experience for me and for uh, a lot of the people I'm working with. We can just start with this picture. If I land a steel column on a concrete foundation, then I'm subject to all the rules for anchorage in the design of those anchors. If I land a concrete column on the same foundation, then what I'm really doing is just dropping some reinforcing bars into the foundation. I'm providing some mechanical anchorage, either a hook or a head, and then I use the rules for development and I'm done. Maybe if I'm careful, I might want to do a check on the shear capacity of that panel zone region. Uh, but most of the time, people don't do that, not at the foundation level. So these are two identical problems in terms of the reinforced concrete in that foundation. It really doesn't care that in one case we call it a reinforced concrete column, and in the other case we call it a steel column with anchor bolts. But we treat it completely differently from a design standpoint. In fact, the steel people, AISC, they claim that this was done on purpose by ACI to penalize steel construction. That's how bad the conversation gets. And you have to say, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the intent here. In fact, we know that the equations that we use for anchorage apply on the other side. But it's a question of how they apply and under what circumstances they would apply. So we've done some tests. Uh, we spent some money to try to understand this problem. Because as you see on the screen, the reliabilities for 
an anchor type of design using the rules we currently have are probably in excess of four, and the beta for this other thing we're doing in the reinforced concrete world could be as low as two, depending on the edge distance, splitting conditions, et cetera. So in practice, what's been happening is that engineers are using the reinforcing design provisions to solve anchor problems. You would do it if you were confronted with that paradigm of a beta of four versus a beta of two, and you needed to execute an efficient design, and you said, well, the code says I can do it this way. You would do that as well. I would probably do it, although now I would not because I know it's just wrong. What happens when you pursue anchorage from the standpoint of reinforcing bar development is that you ignore failure modes entirely that will likely occur when you have groups of bars. And that's what has played out in practice, uh, and we're trying to solve that now and try to wind that story back uh, so then engineers have a better handle on this. The reason it came up is that in the nuclear industry, they've been doing groups of bars welded to reinforce, uh, excuse me, to embed plates for decades. That's a standard anchorage technique in the nuclear world. You, they do it here in Europe. You take a steel plate and you weld a bunch of reinforcing bars to it, or in this case, what we call deformed wire anchors, which are nothing more than dimpled wire bars that are then stud welded to the face of the plate. And you put that in the formwork and then you can anchor it to that plate, right? It creates an anchorage point for the nuclear world. And the assumption was the number of bars times their area times the yield is the capacity of that connection in tension. And it was a reasonable expectation because they said the code says, as long as I make those bars, as long as they're supposed to be for development, I should be good. So we ran a few tests. I say we in the expansive sense. These tests were run by Amit Varma uh, at uh, Purdue University uh, and his student, uh, uh, Rachel Chichi. And uh, it was stunning, right? They carved this cone out of the specimen that they tested. This was a very heavily reinforced specimen. What you're seeing is the result of 25 number, what we call a number six bar, uh, roughly about 20 millimeters in diameter. 25 of them in a grid pattern loaded in tension to failure. And this failure occurred well below the yield point for those bars. All of those bars were embedded to the length that the code said they should be for full development. Now, many engineers looked at this and they said, well, what, I would never do that. You know, I would never put 25 20 millimeter bars in a big section of concrete like that. But in fact, it happens all the time. We see it all the time in design. And not with straight bars, but with headed bars and with hook bars, but more often with headed bars. And that's where things really start to get dicey. If you can get a failure like this with straight bars, and in particular with deformed wire, which has a bond of maybe 70% of a normal ribbed bar, then you know that when you have headed bars, you're going to have a real problem with breakout. Right? So this was a big wake-up call for a lot of people. Uh, it's led to this general investigation of the use of reinforcing bars for anchorage. If you go through our current 318.19 code, you will see the term anchor to develop everywhere in the code. Anchor to develop. It's an instruction to the engineer. So the intent there is to say, well, to develop a bar means to get it to its yield strength. And you, the engineer, are responsible to anchor that bar so that it can reach its yield strength. But the only mechanism we give you to do that is a linear equation for development length. That's got to stop. So we have a, a new subcommittee uh, to try to study this problem. I've developed a few example problems for the subcommittee to chew on. This is one of them. Uh, if you imagine uh, uh, an embed plate like the one I was talking about before with headed bars, uh, you can run the calculations for development length under the code and calculate the capacity of that connection based just on the area of those headed bars times their yield, uh, in this case at about 2,500 kilonewtons. The length of the bars in the concrete is dictated by that equation. In this case, I'm using a big 1.6 multiplier on that length that indicates I don't have any confining reinforcing around those bars. If I have confining reinforcing, it's different, and I'll show that in a second. But even when I take the long length required for those headed bars in a group, and I calculate the 
actual breakout strength, and I'm not calculating the breakout strength at the 5% fractal with cracked concrete. I'm calculating it at a mean strength level. I'm using a K of 40 here, and I'm just doing a very simple breakout calculation. I have a deficit of about, what, 600 kilonewtons already on yield, on nominal yield. I'm not even talking about real yield of these bars. So if I do the same calculation, and I assume I've got confining reinforcing, let's say I'm in a column, and I say, well, you know, now my bars are confined. I don't need that 1.6 multiplier anymore. My deficit just grew from 600 up to, I don't know what that is, 1,400 kilonewtons. I'm not even close. I'm not even in the same universe to get those bars to yield. That's a very dangerous situation. So the tests that we've done at Berkeley with Jack Maley have been to try to understand the interrelationship between strut failure, breakout failure, other failure modes that might occur. Uh, and those tests made it very evident that breakout failure is dominant. I can't show them to you, but there have been tests performed in Taiwan more recently, a uh, very similar kind of result. Sort of surprising to the people doing the work, like, really? <laughs> Uh, for me, not so much, but uh, that's because I come from a different world. But the realization that this failure mode is dominant in these types of situations uh, is something that a lot of people are seeing for the first time. Fortunately, we also have a way to calculate the increase in breakout capacity that we can affect by the presence of adjacent shear reinforcing. And this has been a long, smoldering topic where a few people have done some research and then let it drop and others have picked it up. Uh, we're trying to bring it to the point now where we can have a model that you could use effectively for a variety of situations and make a calculation. Uh, this little test indicated that with the theory that we're currently using, we were able to predict roughly a doubling in the capacity of this connection, failing by concrete breakout, uh, using appropriate shear reinforcing. And that was very uh, gratifying to see that. Gives me a lot of hope. If you do a calculation like this, and I don't recommend it uh, because it's, it's uh, very difficult to make these things actually figure, but if you tried to do a calculation like this on a beam column joint, and I'm grabbing one right out of our code, uh, you find that you need a theory like that to make the thing work at all. Now, it is true that we've done lots of tests of beam column joints, and they don't all fail by breakout. Right? There are other failure modes that occur in beam column joints, and one of the reasons is that you have a heavy amount of, at least in my world, a heavy amount of confining reinforcing in the column that acts to restrain that breakout failure. Getting that to the point where we can make that work across a variety of cases, uh, we're not there yet. We're still working on that. So as I mentioned, I think at the outset, we have an initiative in 318 to try to address this through an ad hoc subcommittee. Uh, we're working very hard to try to come up with answers. Hopefully, we'll get it done within this cycle. Uh, and also, I have opened this topic up in the uh, most recent iteration of the Provisions Update Committee, uh, which works on the NERP recommended provisions. The recommended provisions, for those of you that aren't close to the US seismic co-development situation, are always the precursor to work that we do uh, on ASC 7 in the Seismic Subcommittee. So I'm hoping that I can foster a more in-depth conversation about how we deal with concrete to steel anchorage, especially in light of these realizations, uh, what's been happening uh, in the design world, and uh, maybe bring a lot of things together at once. So um, that's, the, that's the hope. Uh, in summary, I just want to say that our commitment uh, to uh, this work is ongoing. Uh, we believe that it has resulted in a lot of good uh, in the building world. Um, it is, for me personally, a little depressing that in the length of my career, 30 years plus, uh, I can't see a big increase in the emphasis on these topics at the academic level, uh, but maybe, you know, that'll come. Uh, I think that the work we've done in general has brought us into very close alignment with a number of uh, very smart engineers, and that's been very gratifying for me personally as well as, I think, useful for the, for the company. Uh, and we call that worthwhile work.
I want to show one more picture, and that's of a good friend of mine, Steve Mayen, uh, who we worked with very closely on the non-structural topic. I knew Steve from the days when I was a graduate student at Cal, uh, and he passed away in a very untimely manner in 2018. Uh, he was a brilliant structural engineer, those of you that may have known him. Um, he was a rock star in Southeast Asia. Whenever we went to Taiwan together, students would rush us and try to get his autograph, uh, and uh, I miss him terribly. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, that's, my, that's my comments.